1 Corinthians chapter number 15. One of the most definitive chapters in all of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the ones we have our students go through and uh, they have to do a commentary on it because there's so much heavy, meaty, uh, uh, satisfying doctrine in there. He gives you the gospel right off the bat and then he comes into the resurrection and then he talks about uh, the, the situation with deception and those kind of things that occur and then he begins to go into your resurrected body and what it'll be like. The seed that goes in the ground is not like what comes out of the ground and sown in corruption, raised in power and and and, and sown in sickness and, and so on and so forth and then gives you the resurrected body. But we're here today to talk about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who without Him there would be no resurrection. So the Apostle Paul, obviously dealing with a carnal church, they've gotten a little older now, and Paul is reiterating some things to them. If you would, read along with me. Verse number 11, Therefore, 1511, where, Therefore, whether it were I or they... So we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, notice he's reiterating 1 Corinthians 3 here saying that Christ is the foundation and on no other foundation can any may lay than that which is Jesus Christ. He's simply reiterating, going back over that. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain because you believe the preaching and doesn't do you any good now. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet dead in your sins." Then they also which are fallen asleep, those that have gone on ahead of us in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Heavenly Father, we'd ask now as we come to this very important passage of Scripture that you might grant the liberty to be able to preach this passage to the point that it glorifies you and edifies and encourages the saint. We'd ask, Lord, that if there happens to be lost people listening today, that this message may come across the plate waist high where they're able to grasp it and grab a hold of it and that today on this Easter, this resurrection day, it might be the day of their salvation. Lord, maybe folks are listening in their cars. Maybe folks are watching, gathered in the living room. Maybe they're gathered around in a break room or something as they're taking care of others. We'd ask, Heavenly Father, that only You, through the supernatural inspiration of the Holy Spirit, may enable us to put the passage across in such a fashion that it speaks to the hearts of men and women that are listening. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'd like to say, first of all, I, I guess I would say this is either the greatest if in the Bible or is it if or is. If Christ is not resurrected, and then we have a lot of things to talk about. If He is resurrected, then what we're here to worship today makes all the difference in the world. Three questions I get right off the passage, right off the bat. Number one, could God raise Jesus Christ from the dead? Number two... Did He raise Jesus Christ from the dead? And number three, if He did, and if He could, why did He do it? Just three simple questions, and so I'd like to just kind of go through that in an expository fashion for you to consider. You say, why? Well, listen, here for us, you know what we do? We oftentimes, Jess, you better be listening to me. Listen to me now. If If you go through in life, we celebrate birthdays. I know some people think it's the Antichrist, it's the devil and, and those kind of things, but here's the bottom line. You celebrate the day that you were born. I think you should celebrate two birthdays a year. I think your birthday every year should be celebrated and that's something you do together with your family and I think you should celebrate your spiritual birthday because without the spiritual birthday, you would die and go to hell. And so I think it's just as important to celebrate that day as it is to celebrate your birthday. But we celebrate certain occasions. 
And I've never heard anybody grow tired of celebrating birthdays. Occasionally, females don't want to tell you what their age is. They seem to get stuck on 39, 3 times 13. And so they get stuck there, and they never seem to want to grow older, even though the Bible talks about the fact that you become more valuable as you grow older. But nonetheless, we celebrate birthdays, never grow tired of it. Yet isn't it strange we seem to grow tired of talking about the foundation, the very linchpin, the, the keystone, the cornerstone of our faith, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, preacher, I've heard it a hundred times. Yeah, but how could it ever get old to you? I'd like to say, first of all, well, could the Lord, could God, the Father, raise Him from the dead? Well, notice a couple of things in the passage just to quickly draw it to your attention because if He didn't, then we miss out on a number of things. Number one, if Jesus Christ didn't come up from the grave, what's the point in preaching anyway? What's the difference in us doing this and having some kind of a, uh, of a seminar that's trying to encourage you or trying to get you to sell more of a product or, or to do something to, to try to help you with a marriage or to help you with whatever struggle you may be going through? The purpose of preaching is to edify the saint through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you know what Paul says right there in the passage in verse number 14? He said the preaching is vain. Well, listen, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, that means that when you heard preaching, whether it be from the mouth of a preacher or through the Holy Spirit, from reading the Bible or reading a gospel tract, then he says that not only is preaching vain, means it's not worth anything at all, it's not important and it doesn't matter, but then the faith in the preaching of the death, burial, and the resurrection is also vain. That's a dangerous thing. Because if Jesus Christ didn't come up, there is no point in us gathering for church. There's no point in doing things for eternity's sake. There's no point in preaching about the judgment seat of Christ, the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, the judgment of nations, the millennial reign of Christ, the battle of Gog and Magog, the great white throne judgment. There's no point in preaching on heaven. There's no point in preaching on hell. All the church would be used for is just moral codes to make people better people or to make them be recognized for their own personal game. You know what he says? He says, listen, first of all, preaching, which the Bible says that please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. Number two, he says, if you believe the preaching, that's in vain. Look quickly in verse number 15. He says, not only that, you're a false witness. That means anybody that has ever given the gospel, you're giving the gospel based on your belief that Jesus Christ on this day... Now, let me clarify something quickly lest I be considered an apostate. Number one, Jesus Christ went into the ground at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, not Good Friday. I know what the world does with it, but he says, as Jonas was in the belly of well, this will be in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 40. Josh, you need to wake up. Josh, number, uh, to verse number 40, he said, as Jonas was in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be where? In the heart of the earth. That's three 24-hour days. That's 12 hours day, 12 hours night. 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, Jesus Christ would have been dead. He came up and He said it is finished and His Spirit returned to God and it was over and done with right then. Here's what you have to understand. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock till Thursday night at 6 o'clock, one day. Thursday night at 6 o'clock till Friday night at 6 o'clock, two days. 6 o'clock on Friday night to 6 o'clock on Saturday night, three days. But preacher, he came up on Sunday. Their day begins in the evening time. Our day begins at midnight. Their day begins at 6 o'clock. So at 6 o'clock on Saturday night, he would have come out of the tomb and they didn't show up until a little bit later on when the stone was rolled away and the ladies were there and we'll talk about that in just a little while. I want to get over there in a hurry, but I want you to understand three full days he was in the ground. Jewish time... It's three full days. It's not he went in on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock and he got back up on Sunday morning. That makes for illustrative or illustrative preaching, but it's not biblically true. He says, number one, preaching in vain, faith in vain. Uh, number three, he said, we're false witnesses. Number six, or look at verse number 16. Then guess what he says? There's no hope for you after you die. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure most of you have been to a funeral. I don't know how many of you have had to do a funeral in the sense of preaching it or singing at a funeral or have had to try to comfort someone that has lost someone. 
But you know what he just said? If there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ, then there's no hope that you can give someone who dies now before the rapture takes place. See, the the very cornerstone of what we believe is all hinging upon one thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, died for our sins, was buried on the third day, according to Scripture, and raised again to newness of life. If He didn't come up, we don't have hope for anybody. That would mean that these people now that are dying from whatever this disease is or whatever it is that's going on are dying of natural causes or dying still of, of all kinds of other uh, plagues and diseases and, and things that are going on and dying in car accidents and dying in all manner of fashion. That would mean that the one thing that we as human beings have no hope about if it wasn't for the resurrection that would be the end of everything. We would just be completely done away with because the resurrection testifies of eternity. Look a little bit further. Look in verse number 17. This is a scary thought. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. You know what that would mean? The resurrection, and I'll show you this in a minute, is a testimony. It's a proof that the atonement was accepted. Do you ever think about that? That's passages found over in Romans chapter number 4, which I'll get to in just a minute, but did you ever think about that? Did you ever think that the Lord was resurrected as more than just for a testimony that God could raise Him from the dead, but also the fact that He came up from the dead says that the atonement, the price that had to be paid for my sins and yours was accepted by God the Father and the testimony of that is is that He resurrected Jesus Christ and what He basically said is here's my seal, here's my stamp, here's my proof. I'm showing you by His resurrection that His blood atonement is enough to pay for you and for me. If that's not shouting ground, I don't know what is. If that's not an opportunity to have a, an Easter dinner, a Passover, I mean a, a resurrection dinner, to be able to say, you know what, thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sins. I know I'm washed. I know I'm clean. I know I may not be perfect now, but I'll be perfect in the hereafter. And I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for coming up with you. Say, why? It's a testimony. But in the passage, he says, listen, no hope there in your faith because you don't have any forgiveness of your sins. Look in verse number 18. And those which are falling asleep, guess what happens? He said, they're perished. That's those that went on. Not the ones that you can't give any hope to now, but the ones that are already gone. Your loved ones that have passed away. I can't comfort anybody that has lost a loved one. And we've had our share of it here. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, the only hope I can give them, the only thing I can tell them is, is thank God for the resurrection of Jesus Christ because your loved one is now seated with Him in heavenly places, literally. I realize that when you get saved, that immediately your standing is seated with Him in heavenly places and your state changes uh, based upon what you do. But did you ever realize that if you have a loved one that's lost, my dad died a lot of years ago now. You think, well, you, you eventually get over it. You learn to live with it. I don't know that you ever get over it. But my dad died. You know what a comfort it is to me to know that when I was with him, when he passed away, that I knew that he was leaving from that place where he was and going to a better place. You know where I know he is now? You say he's over there in Arlington Cemetery, over there in Arlington, not but a few blocks from where your mama lives and that kind of thing. No, that's his body. That's not him. His soul is up there in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that if Jesus Christ hasn't resurrected, that I would either have one of two things, either questions, well, what happened to him? Did he get annihilated? Is he gone away? Will I ever see him again? Or number two, I wouldn't have any hope for him at all. I would say those things had already occurred. You don't realize how much is emphasized on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The whole thing that we believe about this comes to absolutely nothing without his seal or his stamp of approval of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look, if you will, please, down in verse number 19. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Meaning that if He didn't resurrect and you had only hope in a good man or a good prophet and now He's dead and gone and He didn't leave anything behind for you, you know what He says? We are of all, we are of all men most miserable. Can I say this about that as I try to go through this passage and peel some things out of it that might be a help or an encouragement to you? Can I say this? Do you see the emphasis on spiritual things? 
Do you see the emphasis where the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter number 3, he said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees above the law, blameless, trained at the feet of Gamil, and I had all those things, which things I counted but dung, that I might know Him, the power of His resurrection, the power of His resurrection, the power of His resurrection, through the fellowship of His sufferings. Do you see the emphasis that Paul is saying, listen, I had all the monetary, all the material, all the earthly things. I had the reputation. I had the status. I had the money. I had the finances. I had uh, the retirement accounts. I had all of those things, but I didn't have Jesus. But after I met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter number 9 and He got me knocked down off of my high horse, my beast, whatever it was that He was riding. It would have been a long fall off of an elephant. But at any rate, He fell down in the dirt and three days later the Lord came by through Ananias and spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And three days later Ananias shows up and baptizes the apostle Paul and life for him changed. And the emphasis changed from clods to clouds, from the terrestrial to the celestial. Do you see the emphasis? A lot of what's happening in our world today is there's so much emphasis on what's going to be the impact on me in an earthly manner. Can I say this to you? Probably in Africa, other than people getting sick again about something else, they don't have what we have here materially. In a lot of places, I realize there are certain areas of that country, life for them doesn't really change a whole lot. People that are in uh, less fortunate areas of town and things like that, other than being sick, life for them doesn't really change. They They don't really have a lot to lose. But Christians in the last days have got so much that we are so connected to, we're so hooked into, we're so drawn into, we're so morphed into, that we are so much a part of that, that when something like this occurs, the Lord said, hey, you might want to check and see if maybe you're just a little too connected to earthly things. I'm not saying that He's doing it to take it away from you or that there's any sin in having those things. Having those things is one thing. Those things having you is something entirely different. Life has changed for many of us in the last three or four weeks. Whether you watch the news or whether you don't, this issue for us should be about spiritual things, not about whether or not there's going to be a vaccine or whether or not there's going to be some medicine to treat it or whether or not the economy is going to reset and what are we going to do as far as distancing and how things going to crank back up and what are we going to do about the money and what are we going to do about uh, the thing. And and I'm hearing Christians talking about earthly, 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 earthly. Is it possible on this resurrection morning, on this this day that we could kick it out of gear for just a minute and say, you know what? Suppose it doesn't go back to the comfort that we had before. I still got Jesus Christ, Him crucified, but Him also resurrected. I see a a severe lacking on our part as Christians. I can't speak to the rest of the world. Their God is mammon. Their God is money. Their security is in physical things and physical promises and physical health and physical wealth. I understand that. And this is not for them. This is for those of us that are saved. Our emphasis should be, hey, if this was it, Would I be ready to meet the Lord at the judgment seat? We've all been talking about it happening sooner or later. And lo and behold, it is upon us. And what a great blessing, what a great privilege, what a great thought or an idea that we have the chance to be a witness during this time. We're getting to experience an opportunity like none other to say, listen, let me show you my faith put to the test. I don't think it's the time to be arguing with people that are running contrary to how you're believing. I think it is a time to pause and say, what do people see when they see me? Am I looking at the resurrection? Am I saved? If I am saved, I do my best to be as protective as I can, but suppose everything doesn't go back to what it was. Okay, well, I'm still in the boat with Jesus. Can I give you three or four things here to think about? Number two, could he? Yes, he could. Number two, did he? Look in verse number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. That's important. 
if he be not, but he is. So if that's the case, the Old Testament prophesied it in Jeremiah. The Old Testament prophesied it in Isaiah 53. The Old Testament prophesied it in Psalms 22. The Old Testament is used as an example with Jonah being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Old Testament uses that as an example of Jesus Christ being there and Him being raised again. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number uh, 21, 22, 23, right along through there. You know what he said? And he that ascended is not he that descended first and led captivity captivity. You say, what does that mean? He came up. He's resurrected. Did He? Yes. Did He come up? Well, the Bible said so. You mean you believe the Bible? I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe what God says about it. You say, what? That's where my eternity is at stake. I learned about Jesus Christ through the preaching of the Bible. The Bible said that He came up. Uh, Number two, in the Old Testament it was prophesied. Number two, there were a couple of angels that said He did. The Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. When Peter preaches in Acts chapter number 2, you know what he said? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Not like David, whose sepulcher is still with us. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen. He's preaching the resurrection in Acts chapter number 2. And as he begins to preach that, ladies and gentlemen, can I say this to you? As he begins to go through the process of that, he's recalling back to when their faith was in everything but Jesus Christ, Him crucified and buried and raised again on the third day. The Bible clearly teaches that in both the Old and the New Testament. And then the Bible also tells us that the angels at the tomb, they said, hey, listen, now if I'm drawing the picture, I would draw it this way. If I could paint, I, I'd love to paint it this way. I, I see that early in the morning, about 6 o'clock on what would be for us Saturday night, about 6 hours before our day changed to Sunday. And so now it would be Sunday, the first day of the week. Their Sabbath is over. And I, I would have the Lord come up in the ground and uh, come up from the ground there, laying out there in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I'd have him come up out of that tomb and stuff and, and look around inside that place and have a couple of angels down there sitting, one on the forehead, I mean one at his feet and one at his head, a picture of the mercy seat. I don't have time to go into that, but I, <coughs> excuse me, I'd have him uh, sitting there like that and I'd have the Lord say, now, I need to think about this thing. Well, they said, well, Lord, you know, you can just walk right through the, the stone there. You'd be all right, right? And the Lord said, well, it's going to kind of be difficult because if I just walk through the door, walk through the thing... Did you get me some water, man? Did you get me water? Okay. Uh, if I walk through the door uh, right now, then other people aren't going to be able to see in. Now, you're going to think this is corny and this is crazy and it's whacked out, but bear with me if you would for a moment. The Lord didn't move the stone away because He needed to get out. The Lord moved the stone away so we could get in. See, what we often miss is is that even in His resurrection, He doesn't do it to show His power and His might and to show what a great thing He could do. And like a magician, like a David Copperfield or some other person to be able to molecularly change the matter in His body to meet the matter of the rock and to be able to... Because we know He does that up there in the upper room. He walks through closed doors. He walked through the wall. So the question would be then, why didn't He just walk through the rock? for our benefit, so we could see in the tomb. And he gets ready to go out, and uh, there's the testimony of the folded napkin, which I'll get to in just a minute, and he lays that thing aside. He lays aside the grave clothes, and he gets dressed and ready to go to church on Sunday. And I'm telling the story right now, so bear with me. And he gets ready to walk out, and the angels are coming right behind him. I think it's probably Gabriel and Michael, but you make it whoever you want to be. It's two angels there. And the Lord said, where are you all going? He said, well, Lord, you know, wherever you go, we go. And whatever you say, we say. And we're going to follow you around. And we're going to be like, you know, uh, mercy and grace following David there in the Old Testament and that kind of thing. So, And the Lord said, no, I, I need for you to do me a favor. Gabriel, how about you sitting right there at the head? And Michael, you sit right there where my feet were. And when these people come in over here, you tell them what happened. Because just the empty tomb is not going to be sufficient enough. They'll think any number of other things like... Many people try to teach today. Oh, he swooned and he got up and got out. Or the disciples came and stole him away. Or they had the hallucinogenic theory, the vision theory, that uh, 500 people had a hallucination that Jesus Christ was, was really resurrected. And those, all that is just a bunch of foolishness. But he left behind two witnesses. 
and he walked out and by the time he got to the other side, imagine if you would please, a great earthquake comes and the rock begins to move and the, the sun begins to come up and all of a sudden little stream lights begin to kind of poke their way into the, into the tomb and then lo and behold the Son of God comes up and the whole tomb is flooded with light and the stone is rolled away. Why? For our benefit so we could see in. And he left behind two witnesses. And the women come running in there to anoint his body. It's interesting that the women got up earlier than the men, but I kind of find that to be true more often now than not. They're there in the wee hours of the morning, still dusky dark, and they're headed out there weeping and moaning after the three days of him being in the tomb. And they go and in their mind's eye they're expecting the tomb to be sealed and they realize they're going to have to have someone break that seal of Pilate and move it out of the way. Why to the end of three days? Because the deal had been struck by the religious leaders that Pilate would put his seal there because the prophecy had been that he was going to tear down the temple and raise it up again in three days. So by the end of the third day, they would have had the legal ability to break the seal, move the stone out of the way, because then if he came up after that or somebody stole it, the prophecy would have not been any good because it would have to be dead on. Well, the women arrive at the tomb and the guards are sound asleep. They don't get stopped. There's no roadblock. They're not checking them to see what city or state or what a place they came from or turn them around and send them back because they might spread some kind of an epidemic or whatever. They, they walk right past the guards. And I'm sure one of the women, because women have a tendency more so than men, they're, they're planners. My wife is a planner. She's already planning for whenever we crank things back up. When's it going to be? She doesn't know, but she's already planning. So if it's next week or six months from now, she'll be ready to go. That's just how she is. It's a good balance for me. But at any rate, they're planners. And so they're thinking, well, now once we get there, you think we can hoodoo one of those guards into moving the stone away? You think maybe we can talk to the chief of the guards and ask him, would you please do us a favor? Look, look at what we got. We got frankincense, we got myrrh, we got all manner of aloes and spices to anoint the body. You know how people stink after they've been dead and we're just coming to pay our respects. And they're talking, I think, among themselves. What are we going to do when we get there? And when we get there, how are we going to handle it? And when they get there, all the guys are asleep. All these big soldiers, this quaternarian of soldiers, they're sound asleep. And so they're like, well... And they tiptoe past the guards. And somebody looks up there. And coming out of the tomb is a bright light. You say, why? The two angels are in there. And they're thinking this is strange because the sun's coming up over there, but there's a light brighter than the sun coming out of the tomb. What in the world's going on? I got to give it to you. The women sure had courage because they didn't hesitate. They went right into the tomb. And you know what they said to the angels? Not recognizing the supernatural phenomenon that the one body that was there now have two men sitting there clothed in white raiment and shining garments and they're sitting there. You gotta hand it to the women. You know what they say? What'd you done with Jesus? Sidebar for just a second. What have you done with Jesus? Since he was resurrected for you and since you've been saved, what have you done? with Jesus. But lest I digress, can I give you this quickly? The angel says, uh, the Lord left us back here to tell you because He figured you probably wouldn't believe Him when He told you this was what He was going to do. Oh yeah, well He told us that and well, yeah, well obviously you don't believe it, but why seek ye the, watch it, living among the dead? He is risen. Behold the place where they laid Him. Here's the evidence. There's the grave clothes wadded up. There's the napkin upon His face that's folded up. He's not here anymore. Where He is risen. Behold where He was, but He's not there anymore. Now, the story to me takes an interesting turn here because it gets sort of humorous. It's funny to me a little bit. Because when the women go running back to tell the men, the men don't believe the women. 
I don't know, maybe that's a macho thing, maybe that's a man thing, uh, maybe the guys were too distracted by whatever else it was they were doing, but they must have been from Missouri. They said, you know, we're not going to believe it unless we see it. And so Pete and John take off running. And John, probably in a little better shape than Pete, and maybe even a little bit younger than Pete, he gets to the tomb, and right when he gets to the tomb, I think he, he kind of hesitates. According to what the Bible said, the other one comes running past him. I have a picture of that in my office. Bold Peter steps into the midst of that whole thing, and the angel said, you didn't hear what the women said? He's not here. He's risen. Well, then they go back to tell others, but guess what happened? They go back in fear and, and those kind of things. And we know that not only does the Old and the New Testament prophesy about the Bible, but the two angels told us, that's where I'm at, at the tomb that He was risen. And then Jesus appears 11 times after His resurrection to a multitude of other people. The empty tomb also speaks. How else do you explain it? I already told you about the theories. Take your Bible, if you will, please, and let me try to hurry along here. Look in Romans chapter number 1. If He could raise Him, and He did raise Him, then why did He raise Him? First of all, to fulfill a promise as proof to you and I. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 3. Concerning the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the finish, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Watch it. How is He declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness? By the resurrection from the dead. Now you know what He just said to you? He said, proof I am who I am is I was resurrected. People that downplay this over and above every other holiday we do, whether as a Christian or not as a Christian, of every other thing, this is the key ingredient to Jesus Christ to show you He is God manifest in the flesh. It is Him showing you as proof according to what we just said. How do I prove I'm who I say I am? I was resurrected from the dead. Can I say this? Resurrected under His own power. No one else has ever been resurrected under their own power. Jesus raised people and will be raised again in the last days. Number one, to fulfill the promise or proof. Look in Romans chapter number four. This isn't the Romans road, but it's something uh, to give us as believers reassurance of atonement. Look in Romans chapter number 4, look in verse 23. Reassurance of the atonement. Therefore, verse number 22, make it. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone, but that it, I mean, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, watch it, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You know what he just said to you there? He just said the believer's assurance of salvation, the believer's assurance of justification. Uh, the old adage is just as if I never sinned. The believer's assurance, the believer's justification is the very fact that you believe in the death of the barrel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've had the privilege on a few occasions to lead somebody to the Lord. And many people oftentimes that are not really well informed, they say, well, I believe that Jesus was here and I believe Jesus was God's Son. I even believe Jesus died on the cross and I believe He was a good man. Okay, do you believe He was buried? Well, yeah, if He was a man, He died, He was buried. Okay, key ingredient. Do you believe He came up on the third day? What do you mean? Well, if he didn't come up, what's the point in believing in him? I, I can believe that Mao Zedong existed. I can believe that Hitler existed. The history books tell me that. I, I can believe in Bloody Mary. I can believe in, in Attila the Hun. I can read all of those historical accounts and even see pictures of some of them, whether it be by, by pen and ink or whether it be by a portrait or whatever. I can believe the historical account. But the key ingredient is not just that he died and was buried for our sins and was buried, but that he came out of the tomb. Without that, there's no difference in Jesus and anybody else. While we know He was tempted in all points, yet without sin, you have to understand that your sinless Savior died, was buried. Key ingredient when you're leading somebody to the Lord, do you believe He rose again on the third day? Well, preacher, that just, I mean, that just doesn't even make any sense. You say, why? Because you've never seen anybody bridged from the dead. Can you imagine if you had seen Jesus raise the widow of Nain's son? 
Can you imagine if you had seen uh, the Lord go there by a graveyard and raise somebody like Lazarus over there in the book of John chapter number 12? He raises Lazarus out of the grave after four days and those kind of things. And he raised him. If you saw that, you would think to yourself, well, you know what? I've seen him raise people from the dead, so maybe it's not impossible. Yeah, but the problem is who raised him? Jesus raised the other ones, but... Who raised Jesus? Well, God raised Jesus and He came up under His own power. Why? Because He and God are one and the same. But if you had seen a resurrection, don't you think it might have been a little easier? But for us in this day and time, you've never seen a resurrection. I dare say, whether it's on television or God forbid you've been to a funeral home, I I dare say that nobody here has not seen death, but you've never seen anybody get up. Why is that important, preacher? Well, certainly you can see it's because faith is required for you to believe not just the death and the burial. We get that. We've seen that. But the element that activates that faith is belief in something you can't see. Faith is the evidence of things not seen and the evidence of things hoped for. You know what he says to you? He said, you have to believe in something you've never seen before. You say, why? Because by grace through faith are you saved. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can I say this to you? He said right there in the passage, for your assurance and for your justification, the resurrection took place. Look in Acts chapter number 17. And you have to back up to the left toward the book of Matthew there. Acts chapter number 17. Could he? Yes. Did he? Yes. Why did he do it? To fulfill the promise that he made to you because he's not a liar. You know, Jesus always said He was going to rise again. And He did. Did you ever think that His testimony would be in question of all of the things that He said He could do? Excuse me, they had seen on a multitude of occasions Him doing great miracles. Five barley loaves and two fishes feed 5,000 men, let alone women and children. The widow of Nain's son resurrected from the dead. Blind Bartimaeus is given his eyesight back and other people having their eyesight restored. The the palsied man having his legs and limbs restored. Blind Bartimaeus and the other ones that I've already given to you. They had seen him do miracles before. But prophets in the old days did miracles too. But here's the thing that he kept saying, but I'm going to rise again, but I'm going to rise again, but I'm going to rise again. And everybody was like, yeah, well you might have done all these other miracles. But we've never seen anybody that once they're dead come up out of the ground again under their own power. Acts chapter number 17. To let everybody know that there's no doubt that there will be a day of judgment. Acts chapter number 17. Look if you will please in verse number 30. The Bible says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, of what? In that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, I want you to notice a couple things here. It's important. Verse 31, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man... So he's saying there's the assurance of judgment coming and I'm saying that is assured to you because he came up out of the ground. I can't say you're going to be judged by me in 20 years. I could be dead. 10 years, I could be dead. 5 years, I could be dead. I can't make that promise. But he says the promise of judgment coming is the fact that he came up out of the ground. You know, I I think something that you might consider is Many of us have prayed for years for God to do a multiplicity of things, let alone get people in the United States of America, if not even the world, to get their attention, to turn their eyes upon Jesus, to recognize that their need for focal, the focus on eternal things is important. Suppose this is an answer to our prayer. Just suppose, for the sake of our discussion this morning on Easter morning, Resurrection Day, uh, uh, maybe just consider for a minute that one of the testimonies of the resurrection is judgment's coming. 
What if the Lord used what's happening now to have individuals that have heard the gospel or had would not turn into the gospel or maybe you're listening today who never even thought about the gospel and they just decided, you know what, I'm going to sit down, I'm just going to hear what some preachers have to say about this. God help us if they turn to some places and they're having some sort of a, uh, of a dance contest or they're having some sort of a show or they're playing some kind of a game. When people are searching, when people are looking, if they turn in and they hear the political ideas or the prejudicial ideas or the preferences of what preachers, instead of saying, hey, Jesus Christ was resurrected and part of that is so that you understand there's a day that He is going to judge the unsaved by that man. You know what that means? That means let me out. I'm getting in at Calvary's cross because I want to get saved because I'm going to have His righteousness and not my righteousness. You know what that says to me? That no matter what position or reputation I may have down here, as far as eternity is concerned, I don't have to worry about that judgment. But he says part of the preaching of the resurrection should be to remind those people that are lost, there's a day of judgment coming and you have to match your righteousness with His righteousness. I've studied the life of Jesus Christ. I had it in three different schools that I went to. I had it in other things that I had to do. I've had the life of Christ studies. I've had Sunday school classes on the life of Christ and the miracles of Christ and, and the baptisms and all the other kind of things that are there about Jesus Christ. And uh, Those things are great to know, but I don't have to worry about the judgment about His life on me because I've done this in my studies. I've never found one time where he ever messed up. There's nothing I could point to him and say, oh yeah, but remember you lied or you cheated or you stole or you had the wrong thoughts or you did this or you did that. You know what that does? That shakes me to my very core because I realize it's not just that I can't keep the law, I can't live a life like he lived. And I don't want to have my life compared to His life. And that only way I can get there is if I am at least equal to, if not above, that of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. Maybe in your own mind you're thinking to yourself, I'm looking so nobody thinks I'm talking. I should probably say this this way. But I don't know if you think you're so holy and so just that you would even stand a chance at the great white throne to compare your righteousness as His righteousness. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Paul even says, you know what? I'm chief of apostles and then in a short period of time, you know what he says by the conclusion of his ministry? I'm chief of sinners. You know one of the things the resurrection testifies to? It's not only that the atonement was made, It's not only that justification is promised, that the sin has been justified and taken care of, but you know what it is? It's the promise being fulfilled that there's coming a day of judgment. Easter, Passover, not, not Passover, excuse me, Resurrection Day for us should remind us that because of what He did, we can celebrate the resurrection. I'm not saying celebrate sinless perfection. I'm saying that when I get up there, that if even the devil himself comes to accuse me before I were to enter in up there, if he were to come and accuse me, they would go pull my book of my life down and as far as my entrance into heaven, that record would be imputed to Jesus Christ and I would have imputed to me His righteousness and that record would be blank pages and my sin would have been put on Jesus Christ and when He got crucified, He paid for that sin, resurrected the third day, my justification is complete. But if you're listening to me today and you're lost, you know what? The day comes where you'll have your chance. Let's say that today on Easter Day, I would forbid this to happen, but today you die. You go straight to hell. We'll have your funeral here. or We'll have your funeral at whatever part of the country you're in. And then after the funeral is over and done with, everybody surmises whether you were saved or not saved or whatever. But you'll know. You'll know exactly where you are. You will either be in heaven or hell. If you're lost, you'll be in hell. You'll be burning, screaming, hollering, yelling, just like the rich man did. Lord, come to have the lizard dip his finger in the water and come cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. And you'll have a voice to be able to scream. You'll have a tongue that'll be able to be dry. You'll have a mouth that'll be desiring water. You'll have eyes that can see things that are going on. And you will be able to feel those flames torment you. But you will get your day in court. 
And at the great white throne, after the battle of Gog and Magog is completed and heaven and earth pass away, and everything in the universe is wiped clean, and there's nothing there but God's throne, the saved people behind Him here, and then all of you that have gone to hell come up there in front of Him, and the Lord said, okay, it's your chance to testify for yourself. You get an opportunity to have your day in court. And you get to stand up there and the Lord said, Okay, proclaim your righteousness. Show me your sinlessness. Show me your life, why I shouldn't put you now from hell into the lake of fire. And by the way, here's your measuring stick. By judgment, Romans that you... I mean, Acts 17 that you just read it. By the judgment of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, resurrection. Why? Because He's pure. He's perfect. He's clean. He's holy. He's righteous. That's your measuring stick. Did you lie? The Bible said all men are liars. Did you cheat? Did you steal? Did you do something hypocritical? You say, preacher, you've, you've done all of those things. Yeah, but here's the difference. They're no longer imputed to me. I have His righteousness now because I'm a saved man. I'm a Christian that can still sin. But sin's no longer imputed to me that will keep me out of heaven. I don't know what it would be for you on that day of judgment. And maybe some of you want to take your chances. I wouldn't want to do that. First Thessalonians 4, if you could, quickly. I'm almost done. Hope you haven't fallen asleep there just yet. First Thessalonians chapter number 4. Could he and did he? Yes. Why did he do it? To fulfill his promise. To give us assurance that the atonement was completed and made for and our just, for our justification. To tell us there's a coming day of judgment. And then to give saved individuals in Christ the assurance that they're going to be raised from the dead. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, one of my favorite passages on the rapture. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, verse 13, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that's the ones that are dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. It's hard not to go through the rest of the passage there because he talks about those which are asleep. Look in verse 15, For this we say unto you the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, go ahead of them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice of the ark, and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ rise first, we which are alive and raised, so on and so forth. And then he says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. You know what his resurrection means? It means that those of you that have lost loved ones, Let me rephrase, those of us that have lost loved ones. Or if you are at the point of dying now, you know what the assurance is? That if you die, for you to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. His resurrection means there's hope for those that have died and if you are dying. Why? Because if Jesus Christ got up, it means His promises to get you up are going to take place. I don't know how that's all going to play out in the sense of how it will look visually, but the Bible tells you in that passage there, in 1 Corinthians 15, which is where we started, He says to you that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed suddenly in the twinkling of an an eye. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, He says that the dead shall rise first. 1 Corinthians 15 said they went in corruptible, they come up incorruptible, sown in weakness, raised in strength, sown a terrestrial, celestial body, a terrestrial body, excuse me, earthly body, raised a terrestrial, celestial body, from earthly to heavenly, from terrestrial to celestial. That's what I get for trying to use big words. Do you pause and thought that maybe Easter is a little bit more, maybe Resurrection Day is a little bit more than where we put the emphasis before? Do you understand now why some of us don't like to see the emphasis shift to bunnies and eggs? Do you understand the reason why there is a satanic influence to do their best to take the emphasis off of this day, the Resurrection Day, and to focus it on bunnies and eggs and Easter dresses and hats and dinners and family and all that other stuff as opposed to making it... You say, why? Because 
even if He died on the cross for our sins, and He was buried, but if He didn't come up on this day, Paul said, you know what? We are of all men most miserable. You say, why? Because we're going to die in our sins and have no hope. Our hope is in the resurrection. Not in whether or not the government does or doesn't come up with an answer to whatever this is that's plaguing our nation. Is it any surprise that we actually are receiving judgment? The way this nation, this country has lived after being given so much, is it a surprise? I mean, is it astonishing to you that we should be treated any different than Sodom and Gomorrah and Bazaar? Oh, it's not just because of homosexuality. But look at to uh, just from a Christian standpoint. Hey, is this a good time to pause, to sit down, to think to yourself, you know something? Have I taken church for granted, the Bible for granted? Have I, have I taken prayer for granted? Have I taken singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Have I gotten so busy with sports and other activities that the emphasis is not... And now all of a sudden it's kind of like, wow, I can't do anything else. I, you know what? I sure do miss church. But I wonder if our nation may not be called to a position now of repentance from the church's standpoint to say, hey, maybe your focus needs to be tuned back in to the right thing. I don't know. I try to make it a habit and it's not because I'm spiritual. I learned this when my wife was going through some of the other stuff and one of our doctors that we see that's up north and stuff like that, he's always had this bad habit. He thanks God for all the trouble. I think that's a biblical thing and, and that's a good thing to do. So now what I try to do is when I, when I pray, I, even if it's just like an honorable mention on the end, I try to say, Lord, and thank you for the virus. I'm not saying I want the virus. One of my friends down south of here, he said, you know, he said, oh yeah, I'm down here probably exposing myself to the virus. I said, you can have it. I don't want that. I don't care if it's the sniffles. I don't care if it's cold. I don't care if it's a flu. A friend of mine had it, had 104 temperature for like three days. I don't want that. I'm like a wah wah when it comes to being sick. I don't want that. You want to make fun of it, make light of it, you know, get it. Don't mask, don't glove, don't suit up. That's your business. I don't care. I'm simply asking you, can we transcend the earthly for just a moment this morning? Can this resurrection day in 2020 maybe be a call to the church to say, hey, this is a spiritual thing and this is going to depend first of all on our prayers for our people in the church. And second of all, that God might use this to bring us back into fellowship with Him. Your nation's not going to return. You can't claim Second Chronicles 7.14. That has to do with the nation of Israel and the whole nation is not going to do what's necessary to do in order to get God to do that anyway. But you as an individual can do that. I'm simply saying if we know Romans 8.28 is in the Bible and that we know all things work together for good of them, call God them, uh, call them that are called them that are... We know that all things work together for good to them that are called according to His purpose. Do we consider this to be a good thing? Why are Christians complaining so much about their liberties being taken from the government? Their liberties to go to the donut shop when it'd be better if they didn't. Their liberties to go to the restaurant. Their liberties to have their kids into public school so they don't have to put up with them. Their liberties to be able to go into the bank and do business or go to the store and do business or travel from state to state or country to cursing. Why is it that Christians are complaining about earthly things? Is it possible that the Lord said, Hey, listen, be okay with y'all. I'm going to go ahead and send... Rain on the just and the unjust. And I'm going to let my people shine to show them it ain't about earthly stuff. Or is it a thing that God is saying to us as His church? Hey, your focus has been in the wrong place. And is it a real opportunity for us to now say, you know something, Lord? I need to make some changes. This resurrection day... In April of 2020 is a turning point in my life where I'm going to say, Lord, I like to get back to wherever it was I thought I was going, but I don't want to do it like I did before, leaving you behind. 
Lord, I'm going to keep you with me and have you go with me as far as you can go with me. And if I start to go further than you want to go, Lord, I want to stop and stay with you. Because what I'm seeing, ladies and gentlemen, I realize the church in the last days ends in apostasy. But what I'm seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is is a church that has forgotten the resurrection. And it is more concerned and consumed with their physical liberties than they are in their relationship with the one that died, was buried and resurrected again on the third day. I think we should have an example illustrated by Jesus Christ who was dead for three days and his soul was in hell and then went over to paradise and preached to the spirits there and so on and so forth and then came up on the third day. I think it would be good if we as Christians were not resaved, but resurrected to newness of life again and back in fellowship with Jesus Christ and realign our priorities. Let's say they turn everything back on and Life has the chance to reset to where it was. Will you reset? Will you go back to where you were before? Where Sunday is a sports day? Sunday is a fishing hunting day? Sunday is a soccer football day? Sunday is a travel day? Sunday is a business day? Sunday is a beach day? Sunday is a lake day? Sunday is a family reunion day? Sunday is anything else? You say, well, I'm saved. I don't have to be in church to be, uh, to be saved. No, you don't, but what kind of Christian are you? One of the things that I'm hearing today, if I just give me a couple more minutes here, oh, while you're sitting there, could you please listen to me? I'm seeing people that never complain about anything else and even are somewhat unfaithful and sporadic and they're coming to church and all they're complaining about is why is God doing this to us and why is God doing it? What's the government doing it on? I'm thinking to myself, can't you see what this is really about? It's not about whether He's judging our nation. It's smelling salts, it's ammonia capsules, spiritually up our nostrils to say, hey, remember me? I will have no other gods before me. Why, I am a jealous God. And you've used my day that I came up for and started things off with the Apostle Paul, and you meet on the first day of the week now, and instead of giving me the first fruits now, that day has become to you like any other day. It was the day I was resurrected from the tomb to save your miserable soul. And how quickly you have turned it into a day just like any other day. How would an unsaved person know to do anything but that? So that message is not for the unsaved. That message is for the saved. Because because of the resurrection... The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 4, he says, or 5, excuse me, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What have you been giving yourself for in 2019 in the first three months of 2020? Isn't it really a blessing in disguise that the Lord has pulled us back from all of the material and monetary things that has driven our life and make us pause and go, you know what? I need to get my focus back on Jesus Christ. Him crucified, buried and raised again the third day. He says in 1 Corinthians, I won't go back to the platform here, but he says in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, but now is Christ resurrected. What does it mean to you? What a great opportunity for us to reset. Whether we, whether we get the stuff back or not. Whether we get the things back and get our liberties back. I, I'm so worn out with that. With the emails of, look, they, they, took their, they took their liberties away. Well, you've had them for a long time. You've had the freedoms for a long time. You've had the liberty in Christ for a long time. I wish some of you would complain as much about losing your spiritual fellowship with the Lord as much as you're complaining about 
the government taking away your right to worship. You have a chance to worship God every single day of your life. And yet most of us have used his day and his body, meaning our temple, for things other than him. And maybe it's just an opportunity to go, you know something, Lord, thanks for reminding me what's really important. Because why? Because right now that's all that matters. Money can't buy you out of this. You can't work your way out of this. You can't shoot your way out. I don't care how much guns and ammunition you got. You can't see it. It's microscopic. You can have a proton beam. You can't do anything about it. The Lord's hit the nation slash the world with something you can't defeat by all the means you thought you had prepared for. You can't eat your way out of it. You can't go and pull up your gold reserves. You can't. There's nothing you can do except pause and say, Lord, you know something? I, I, I think I better check me. My mom used to have a statement a long time ago. I'm almost done. Bear with me. If you don't, you can turn it off. Uh, but I do have Brother Sam keeping a list of when you get running, however many were running, then all of a sudden they start clicking off, then you'll get a letter saying, we know you turned off your internet. That was a joke. My mom used to have a statement. There's two things about my mom. My mom was kind of known for this. She's a great pastor's wife. She, it was said about this. My mom would find something good to say about the devil. Her, her testimony was is that she just wasn't known for talking about people. What a great pastor's wife. I mean, oh, what a great Christian. She just wasn't known for talking about people. To be honest with you, now my brother and sister may, may, may remember something I don't. Now, I may not have the sharpest mind in the world, but I don't remember my mom and dad talking about people. Now, my dad pastored some large churches. I don't remember my mom and dad having a conversation about malcontents and dissidents in, in our home over the dinner table or what other people were doing, other preachers were doing. So I can't claim that any of that that comes from me came from watching my heritage. So the first thing about my mom was is that, oh, she'd find good about the devil. She's always got something positive to say. Sometimes it's even a little bit nauseating. But she's, she's just so kind. She's so gracious. I, I think that's why at her age she, she still has her mind with her. Her body's beginning to fail, but her mind is still doing pretty good. But the second thing she said to me one time after she was getting on to me and I kind of was putting the blame on somebody else and here's what she said, I never forgot it. She said, son, I want you to remember that every time you're pointing a finger at someone else, there's three pointing back at you. You say, oh, that's an old cliche. Yeah, but boy, that has got some weight to it. Because more times than not, we're pointing at people that first of all, we think we're better than them in the first place. And second of all, we haven't taken the time to judge ourselves before we judge others. Too often, we're the individual who has in our own eye a telephone pole sticking out and we're judging people with a little tiny speck of dust in their eye. I'm saying instead of judging the world, instead of judging the government, instead of judging all the other preachers that aren't doing it the way you're doing it or the congregations that are doing it or the people that are writing you know, these lengthy articles on the Internet or they got YouTube or they're, I think the new thing now is Zooming where they get all these guys on there talking and, and they're all Zooming together and, and giving their impressions. I'm saying, have you paused this resurrection day to say, Lord, I'm standing here in need of prayer. There's some things in my life I've gotten my focus off. Last but not least, I'm going to close. Mary comes back to the tomb. We know from the study of the biblical account that Jesus has yet to ascend. And Mary comes to that tomb and there's no one else there. And she's there. She's forlorn. She's saddened. She is heartbroken, and, and I see us in Mary this morning. Because she looks up and she doesn't even recognize, because her mind is so much on what she lost, that she can't even see that Jesus is standing right in front of her. Man, she's crying and she's weeping and she's torn out of the frame, and all of a sudden the Bible says, and she thought... It was the gardener. She never expected to see Jesus in her trouble. She never expected that. She had been there when the angel said, He's not here, He's risen. She didn't believe it. 
And standing right in front of her was Him. And that's us. We don't even see. We say, oh, the government. Oh, our freedom. Oh, our liberty. Oh my God, the economy. Oh, what are we going to do? There goes the money. There goes the bank account. There goes the car. There goes the job. There goes my health. There goes everything. Oh, my goodness. Hey, gardener, where did you lay Him? I want to show respect on Easter, Resurrection Day to Him. Where would you take Him? And the Lord pauses and takes a deep breath. I think He even looks like us today. And shakes His head and says, Mary. And the second she heard His voice and her name called, we see the key for 2020. She calls Him Master. Rabboni, I couldn't see you because something else had become the master in my life. My anger, my bitterness, my hypocrisy, the people I don't like, the things that are going on, my freedoms being restricted, people not listening to me, my health has gone bad, my money has gone bad. I just preached on that last week. And the Lord says, I won't fail you, but boy... Haven't we gotten to a place in this resurrection morning where we're like Mary and the Lord is standing right in front of us? Are we not like the apostles this morning on the boat fearing for our lives saying, Lord, Master, care us not that we perish? Are we not like Peter walking upon the sea and when he saw the tempest took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank? Is that not the condition of the church today whose eyes are everywhere except on the risen Savior? I'm not preaching this as if I have obtained. But it is a great come to Jesus moment in my life to recognize that other things have eclipsed Him. Oh, He's still there. But other things have gotten in the way. I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm not accustomed to this yet. I'm getting a little more uh, familiar with it. But I want to do something if I can today. I I want to ask you to pray with me. Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to touch the TV and and do that kind of thing. But But would you take a moment if maybe with your family. What a great way to restore the family altar. Would you take a moment right now. Wherever you're at, could you just slide off the couch? Maybe get down there on your knees. You don't have to come to an altar here. I'm saying, would you consider for just a moment, oh, Lord, I, I need to get you back first in my life. I need to quit being so consumed with who's lying and who's not lying and whether it's a conspiracy or not and what church is and what church isn't and what preacher is and what preacher isn't and who's an apostate and who's a compromise and who isn't and, and Lord, my, my family and this and that. Lord, you know what I need to do? I need for just a few moments to say, me, I, me. I've let too many things eclipse you and put ourselves in the position. You say what He's doing today. You know what He's doing? He's calling you. He's calling you. You know what He's saying? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, Come home. Jesus is getting ready to walk out of the tomb. He says to Michael and Gabriel, He said, I'll see you boys at the Father's house later. When the prodigal, who never quit being a son, realized I've let this life get in the way between me and the Father, and he came to himself, the Bible said, he said, I must arise and go to my Father's house and say, I've sinned against heaven and against thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. I'm willing to be as one of the hired servants. You know what he was willing to do? He left because prosperity and the call of the far country got between him and the Father. 
And when he came back, he said, you know what's important? The Father. Being over there with him, I'll have my needs met. I don't need to have an inheritance anymore. I just want to be in fellowship with the Father. Hey, Michael. Hey, Gabriel. I'll see you at the Father's house in a little while. Be a young lady by here after a while. I'm going to meet with her and then go up and talk to the Father and then I'll be back down and you know the rest of the story. Let this April 2020, this Resurrection Day, mark it on your calendar. We weren't able to gather in church, but man, when they open the doors, I'm back. And when the choices to crank things up like they used to be come, I'm going to make the choice to follow Jesus. Heavenly Father, I'd ask you this morning that you might comfort us as only you can, that you might help us as only you can, that you might help us to realize our own faults and failures as well as our needs. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection of your only begotten Son. Thank you that you were resurrected as God manifest in the flesh. If there was no resurrection, God pity all of us, man, woman, and child. But thank you, God, that there was a resurrection. And yet, Lord, even though we know that it is the cornerstone of our salvation, God, might you realize, too, that we've allowed many things, good intentions, never intended for it to get out of whack, but my goodness, Lord, how quickly it's gotten the focus off the wrong things. And now all of a sudden, people begin to cry and scream that, We can't go back to church, and yet we haven't even been faithful to what you've given us. Die to our own personal selfish needs and have used your day for something other than you would have it used for. We'd ask your blessings, Lord. Please watch over us. Please care for us. Please help us. Please give us some sense. Give us some common sense. Help everyone that's listening today, Lord, to understand that they need to be in fellowship with you so they can make the right decisions. We'd ask, Lord, to help us and increase our faith. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.